Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So let me start uh, today's uh, Angolova colloquium, which is together uh, is uh, a top in the assembly seminar. And uh, today we have a distinguished guest uh, giving the seminar, Professor Shinlong Lin. Um, I will give you a brief background of our guest. Uh, so, Professor Lin, uh, he was uh, <coughs> he got uh, his uh, masters uh, from uh, National Taiwan University and PhD from Berkeley. Um, then he worked uh, long years at the Bell Labs and Bell Corps and the Taiko R and D uh, divisions. So uh, it was 25 years working on fiber telecommunications, nonlinear optics and all systems which are now installed in the real world to provide us with all this global internet and all waters of which does. So light, fiber telecommunications are all divided. And Professor Chinamin was working at that time when all this stuff was developed. So he knows a lot about it. Um, Professor Chilon uh, Lin was uh, visiting uh, professor at DTU sometime. Um, uh, now he is visiting uh, professor at KPH. He is advisor also of the program uh, in uh, China on photonics. And um, uh, he also, uh, from 2003 to 2007, uh, was uh, chair of uh, professor of uh, photonics at uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, later on he, is, uh, he was professor and uh, also director of photonics uh, research center at the uh, University of Technical University of Singapore. It's my pleasure to invite you to such a this to give this <coughs> talk of wonders of light, laser photonics, global internet, and beyond. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It is my pleasure to be here. And um, um, I visited Stockholm quite a few times in the past. And uh, this is the first time I spent more than a week uh, in Stockholm. And thanks to the uh, Austin of the KDH, whom I know many years ago when he was still working in Harrington Research Lab. OK, uh, the topic of my talk is the wonders of light, laser photonics, global internet, and the yacht. I feel that I'm preaching to the choir here because there are a lot of experts here in, in laser physics. But regardless, I have personal experience in the United States, which I want to share with you maybe some of the stories which I have encountered myself. Now, Stockholm is a beautiful city. And you can see that if you go to the top of the city hall, this is what you can see. Now, if you go to the other side, you can take a picture of city hall just like this and also like this. And so you can see the common characteristic is water. Maybe Baltic Sea and the Lake Mountain, Lake Stockholm, very beautiful. Now, if you have a chance to visit Jordanham from the boat, you can see beautiful surrounding, and this is amazingly beautiful. However, if you go to Egypt, you'll find there's no water, right? It's sand, <laughs> it's a desert. And, but there, thousand years of history, they have the pyramid. And this is the picture I took before the revolution started. Okay? You can see people still dressed uh, like in uh, very old days. And if you look carefully, this is the pyramid, and this is the size of human feet here. This is a fantastic uh, structure in you know, more than 4,500 years in history. So human being has at least 5,000 years of history. But if you look at the technologies which were developed, uh, over these 5,000 years, you can say the last 150 years was the most impressive. Starting from telegraph, telephone, television, uh, airplane, and all the way to uh, transistor, optical fiber communications, and all that stuff, lasers, photonics, it all happened within the last 150 years. And actually, if you look at photonics, really it happened over the last 50 years. So out of the 5,000 years of human history, I think we are lucky to be in this last 50 years. <laughs> and if you look at these uh, major inventions of the 20th century, the most important one is re really invention of the airplane. In 
1903, and then at the end of the century, the global internet, 1995. There is a debate about which year you can consider the start of the internet, but as far as I'm concerned, internet only began to make an impact around 1995, even though it started as a DARPA project for nuclear physicists trying to communicate with each other. So I put down 1995, roughly the beginning of internet, because that's when they make a huge impact. Now, 2010 is the 50th anniversary of laser invention, and there's a laser festival around the world, including in Sweden. In 1960, Ted Mehman of Hughes Research Lab uh, really demonstrated the first working post will be laser, and that made the whole world very excited. Uh, if you go to the Hughes Research Lab website, they still advertise about the birth of laser in their research laboratory. Now, the other thing is the internet made the whole world smaller. And in between, you had major invention like a transistor, like the wireless communication, satellite, lasers, and all the fiber optic communication technologies. Now, in 1903, the importance of the first flight cannot be overemphasized because they succeeded the first human flight in the air. But if you look at their background, they were actually bicycle engineer. You know, there's no Department of Aerospace Engineering at that time. And whatever they come up with, they learned from bicycle engineer. Hmm. And that's a very interesting observation. And not only that, but whatever they developed for the aircraft, some of the basic principles are still in use today by the aircraft designer. So the first uh, uh, lift-off is December 17, 1903, and that airplane is still in Washington, D.C., in the Smithsonian Museum. So when you go to Washington, D.C., you should go visit uh, this museum. Now today you have, for example, United Airlines. The speed is 900 kilometers per hour, much, much faster. And you, know, you can fly as it is around the world, and so the world becomes a much smaller world because of the invention of the airplane. Now, Airbus is the A380, which is, uh, uh, be began to use about a couple of years ago. I was lucky to have a chance to uh, take one of these between Singapore and Hong Kong. Now, just recently, Boeing announced the success delivery, successful delivery of 787, and this is called the Dreamliner, and it was the first delivery to a Japanese airline company it's called All Nippon Airline. Nippon means Japan, in Japanese. And at, at the news conference, you can see so many people want to see this streamliner. Now, we need to give credit to Howard Hughes, uh, being one of the pioneers in aircraft design after Wright Brothers' invention. Howard Hughes started the Hughes Aircraft Company and Hughes Research Lab, which demonstrated the first laser operation. And not only that, Hughes Later on, he has a space communication division, which actually developed the space probe and the rocket, and later on acquired by General Motors and Boeing Company. Now recently, there is a secret uh, Cold War space program review, <coughs> and you find that the, there's a big spy satellite developed by the defense industry in Los Angeles area, and that was partially responsible for the success of US against the Russia in the Cold War. Now, in addition, Hughes has a Hughes electronics uh, system which developed the first direct TV, allows you to watch BBC and CNN around the world in real time. And so we should give Howard Hughes credit for starting the Hughes Aircraft Company. He himself is an enthusiastic, enthusiastic <coughs> about the design of aircraft, and he actually ran into accident so many times. He's lucky that he didn't die of the you know, test flight. But he's a playboy. There's a movie about him. He played around with the Hollywood movie star. Okay? Very interesting. Uh, like you can go to Wikipedia and all, read all the detail about it. But the other important laboratory or institution he set up is the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And that is one of the premier <coughs> supporting fighting organizations in the world for most advanced <coughs> medical research. Okay, so Ted Mehman announced the first pulse laser action in 1960, and that triggered all the activities in the world. But two years before, Bell Labs, Arthur Shallow, and Charles Tynes actually has the idea of the optical measure, which is the same as the laser, and they actually uh, uh, were the first
first to publish the principle. And so when Nobel Prize was announced four years later in 1964, uh, Ted Mehman was not in it, but the two Russians and Charles Times who developed the, uh, the Mason theory years earlier. In 2010, which is 50th anniversary of laser uh, invention, uh, Charles Times, 95 years old, uh, he's still alive today, so today is 96, he was interviewed, and uh, but five years earlier, in 2005, he was 90 years old. So UC Berkeley, physics department, gave a special celebration uh, called the uh, Forum for uh, Symposium for Vision for Discovery, inviting Nobel winners you know, from this area to attend. At that time, he was 90 years old. So people think it's only now we should give him a celebration. Otherwise, it might be too late, right? He didn't realize he's still alive today. And he toured around the world in 2005, including Korea, China, and uh, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong that time. And because I'm the photonics uh, director, uh, center director, so I was invited to have dinner with him and have a picture with him. And his mind was still very clear. The only problem is when he gave a lecture, he used uh, new grad, and he doesn't know how to use PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> so, look at this. 50 years of laser invention out of 5,000 years of human history. So I think you and I are very lucky to witness this and benefit from the laser invention. Uh, and then, of course, optical fiber communication was started because of people want to use optical carrier. It's a laser line, it's a laser to carry the information. And Charles Kao received the Nobel Prize in 2009 for the work in optical fiber communications. And the two co recipients uh, were the, uh, uh, the scientist engineer at Bell Labs. One is Bill Boyer, and the other one is George Smith. And Bill Boyer used to be my executive director of uh, Bell Labs a uh, long, long time ago. I was very happy <coughs> for him when he got this Nobel Prize because he's already 85 years old. Anyway, you can see the ceremony in physics. I think it's the number one under this, right? So you have Charles Bell. Bill Boyle and uh, George Smith. Yeah. Receive the Nobel Prize you know, from your uh, uh, royal family and receive the uh, award for his work in 1966. This was done in the uh, uh, United Kingdom in uh, Standard Telecommunication Laboratory, Harlow. Okay? So when he got a Nobel Prize, the British said the British scientist received the Nobel Prize. The Americans said the American scientists received the Nobel Prize, while the Chinese said a Chinese received the Nobel Prize. Okay. Unfortunately, when he received the Nobel Prize in age 76, he already developed Alzheimer's disease. So he really couldn't give a clear lecture for the Nobel lecture. So his wife actually delivered the lecture for him, and we all know about it, right? And this is the lecture prepared by Mrs. Kao on behalf of Professor Charles Kao. But the material is actually prepared by my friend in Hong Kong. Okay? And the Chinese University of Hong Kong very excited about this. They have a big celebration. They set up a uh, special uh, auditorium, special collection of the items for all his prizes he donated to the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So you go to the USK, you can see all the prizes he received, including Ericsson Prize, a long time ago. Now, Chinese University of Hong Kong is a nice place, one of the most beautiful campuses in Hong Kong, and like the busy city center, which the image of Hong Kong, uh, you, you would think. So here you can see the mountain, the building, and a beautiful uh, Toro Harbor. Anyway, I was in Hong Kong and invited Charles Kao. That time he already retired from his position as a vice chancellor or president. And I uh, invited him back to share his experience with a student, and we had a good time. At that time, his mind was still very clear. 70, uh, 73 years old. Now let's talk about the uh, general topic of photonics, we know that photonics cover a wide range of spectrum, not just the visible. And depending on the wavelength, your interaction with the matter demands different materials and different equipment, and that's why it's so interesting. Now, we have to thank to Maxwell, who developed the Maxwell equation, which in general describes the EM wave properties. And uh, he is the first one to point out that light is a form of EM wave. And then you have the Heinrich Hertz, we tried to demonstrate that the EM wave exists in free space, and he succeeded. And so today we have Heinrich Hertz Institute in Berlin in honor of him, and that is a very important uh, uh, institution. But we have to wait until the applied physicist or applied engineer 
uh, Marconi to develop into really useful system. So first he tried to send the radio wave over one kilometer, and then it's 15 kilometers, and later on it's across the Atlantic Ocean in, two, in 1901. And that's why in 1909 he received the Nobel Prize for this uh, basic demonstration. This is the first time humankind can communicate instantly across the ocean. Okay, we know the uh, complete EM spectrum is like this, and you can describe it as a wave nature uh, of light, you can describe it as quantum nature of light, and light is so important because it really is the source of all the energy. Uh, without light, there's no light, right? We all know that. But even more importantly, those of us in physics, chemistry, or material science, we know the understanding of the modern physics, chemistry, and life science really come from the spectroscopy studies. Okay? So this is fundamental in understanding of the uh, uh, physics and chemistry and life science. Now, if you are an electrical engineer, you become very familiar with the Maxwell equation because it deals with the light wave all the time. But you can also say, because the quantum nature of light, uh, you need to deal with S quantums. And then you use a floating theory equation. So we need to thank uh, Max Planck for pointing out the energy quanta. And the relationship between the energy of a quanta with the wavelength or frequency is through the Planck constant, as you all know. Now today, Max Planck Institute is the most important research institute in Germany, where you don't have to write any proposal, automatically get the funding to do a forward-looking research. And that's a great place to work. Now, we deal with the photons and electrons. No matter how complex our careers are, we basically deal with the photons and electrons. And this is the photons and electrons in Chinese character. Sometimes you see the same character in Japanese, because the Japanese borrow some of the character from the Chinese a long time ago. Now, one of the major achievements of Einstein is not uh, just the theory of relativity, but actually the discovery of photoelectric effect. So the light shines onto a material and it generates electrons. So that's the basis of photo detector and the basis of solar cell. Okay, so 2010, uh, laser fest was going on, and I think there's a laser fest here in, in Stockholm also. And then this triggered the uh, desire to use the laser to carry information. And so if you look at the history of uh, communication, you find that starting the telegram, radio, and all that, uh, moving from kilobit per second to megabit to gigabit, and now to the terabit per second, uh, somehow this seems to fall on a linear uh, line if you plug it on a semi log scale. That's quite interesting. So these three received the Nobel Prize. And according to the Nobel Prize uh, committee, or NobelPrize.org webpage, they are considered the master of life because it, not only you build the fiber optic around the world, but you also use a CCD camera so you can send image and video across the world at the speed of light. And this is why they are called the master of life. But I thought about this. Who is really the master of life? Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the cloud on land, this is a true fantastic artistic piece. And he is well known to be uh, the artist who can design or who can paint the painting capture the various variations of light. So he's the true master of light, but from the artistic point of view. Uh, today we are talking about engineers and scientists, right? So let's come back to the engineering scientists who are masters of light. And I was asked to give a talk in uh, Singapore, where the Nobel Prize in 2009 was announced in late 2009. So I gave this talk in 2010. I decided to talk about 100 years of photonics and Nobel Prize. The Master of Light is a subtitle which I didn't use, but this is basically what I'm talking about. First, we start with Lorentzian for the accidental discovery of X-ray. And we know how important X-ray is, right? But this is accidental discovery, and that's very interesting. Now, here you have a very good group working on biomedical and X-ray physics. I understand you also have a good spin-off company or something like that. So this is quite amazing. You know, over the last hundred some years, and today you still find very interesting research work here and benefit especially the biomedical industry. Now in 1907, you have the uh, Michelson who received the Nobel Prize for high precision optical instrumentation and the measurement of the speed of light. Then in 1910, 
15, you have the brag and brag. It's a father and son. Right? How many of you work with your father and expect to get a Nobel Prize? This is still historical. And he received the Nobel Prize by really working with his father and making a good contribution. He was born in, in Australia and then uh, uh, trained in uh, Cambridge University. So you go to the Nobel Prize uh, webpage, you'll find that still the youngest uh, Nobel Prize winner. So the model here is, if your father is very good, you better listen to him. <laughs> now, in 1918, uh, Max, uh, Max Planck discovered the quant uh, energy quanta, and, uh, and then you have uh, 1921, Albert Einstein, as I described already, and then 1930, uh, very important, as the first Asian physicist <coughs> called Raman. Now, Raman is a common name in India, but now everybody talks about Raman scattering, Raman spectra, still in the Raman effect, and this is a very important signature or the property of the measure which the light will in with interact with. In 1933, Rodiger and Paul Dirac received the Nobel Prize related to quantum mechanical theory. Now, in 1956, Nobel Prizes were awarded to Bell Lab scientists. Here is Shockley, Martin, and Britain. That's a Shockley, that's Martin, that's a Britain. For their work in 1947, the invention of the first transistor. Now, this is extremely important. Without the first transistor, we don't have microelectronic industry. We don't have IC, we don't have microprocessor. I, I would not have this network computer. And you don't have the digital watch, which costs $10 million. Okay? So this is extremely important. But at that time, AT&T was a monopoly. So by the nature of monopoly, they can charge money for making profit, but they cannot charge the patent. Uh, so they don't make the money uh, from this transistor pattern. So Shockley went to Silicon Valley and started really the Silicon Valley. Start the semiconductor industry. The interesting thing is, not only these three received the Nobel Prize, but Martin here, this is John Martin. He is the true theoretician among the three. He actually is the first person to receive two Nobel Prizes in the same field. This is the PCM theory of superconductivity. This is Martin, University of Illinois professor, who is his postdoc and student. So sometimes, if you find the right professor, even a good chance of getting the Nobel Prize, if you listen to it. Okay, <laughs> who else got the two Nobel Prizes? Madame Curie. If you go visit Nobel Museum now, right now, feature uh, Madame Curie. And she got the Nobel Prize in physics with her husband. And then later on in chemistry by herself. There's another one who received two Nobel Prize, and that's Linus Pauling of Caltech. Received the chemistry Nobel Prize, and later on receiving Nobel Prize for peace, okay. peace Nobel Prize. Okay, the laser work started in Bell in 1958, and then 1964 he received the Nobel Prize, and in 1971 he had Dennis Gable who developed the holographic method. So this is the beginning of holography, and holography. But it is to wait until laser technology is applied to holographic, uh, techniques to make it really useful. Then later on, Shalom, Arthur Shalom, who called, worked with uh, Towns on the laser, he never got a Nobel Prize for that work, but later on in 1981, instead of 1964, 1981 received the Nobel Prize for optical spectroscopy using laser. So he and, uh, and the Brumfield, at that time he left Ballet and went to Stanford University, and Brumfield worked at Harvard University Applied Physics Department. They received the Nobel Prize together, and here you have this uh, Swedish professor, I don't know him, in Uppsala University, received the Nobel Prize for the high resolution electron spectroscopy. Then 1997, Stephen Chu of, of Stanford, together with these two other laser physicists, they received the Nobel Prize for using laser technique to cool the atoms. Now, he was actually working at Bell Lab when I was at Bell Lab. Uh, and the laser cooling and laser trapping technique actually was developed by Dr. Arthur Askin, who was my department head. So I feel pretty bad that he did not uh, get the Nobel Prize together with Stephen Chu, because the technique itself is very sophisticated and very delicate, and that should have been part of the Nobel Prize consideration. So those of you in the Nobel Prize physics committee, 
I welcome you to talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Other acid should have been recorded to him. Because the laser trap and laser cooling uh, and laser uh, um, technique developed after acid. Ten years before Stephen Chu came to home there and used it as tool were extremely important. Okay. And then in the year 2000, there's a Nobel Prize for these two who developed the <coughs> semiconductor heterostructure, which is very important for high speed electronics and optical electronics. Actually, the double heterostructure allows people to design semiconductor diode laser to work efficiently, so they make it a room temperature continuous wave semiconductor diode laser and make it extremely useful. And here is the IC inventor, Jack Kirby, received the Nobel Prize for. IC invention, but he's a co-recipient, Dr. Bob Norris of uh, Intel, at that time already passed away, even though everybody recognized they are the co-inventor of integrated circuit, right? So somebody from Intel didn't get the credit because he died too early, I think 64 years old. So the model here is, is in order to get the Nobel Prize, you cannot die too young. <laughs> okay, and then, you have the Nobel Prize awarded to global work on quantum optics, and these two, including Professor uh, Ted Hench, um, ultra high resolution spectroscopy, laser spectroscopy, and also optical frequency generation. What's interesting is uh, Shaw went to Stanford from Bell Labs, and Ted Hench was actually his postdoc. He was under a NATO postdoc program, so he should thank. NATO for providing such a program, and he did such a good job in Stanford. So he actually moved from postdoc to become assistant associate and full professor. He could have stayed in Stanford for a long time, but he decided to come back to Germany. Uh, and the problem for Stanford is now when he get the Nobel Prize, this is already a Max Planck Institute credit. It should have been Stanford University because the most of the important work was done at Stanford. Okay. And now 2009, we have these three guys in optical communication and CCP. And if you look at 1909, exactly 100 years earlier, you know, McConey received the Nobel Prize for wireless telegraph. So actually, there's 100 years in between, exactly 100 years, from wireless to open optical fiber communication. And this is McConey. And McConey. It's related to Ericsson because Ericsson acquired Marconi in about just a few years ago. And uh, Bell Lab owned the laser pattern, but never made money out of that. And this is the Bell Lab in Murray Hill. That's where a lot of lasers were invented. This is 1961, just one year after Ted Mehman reported the first Ruby laser. The first helium neon laser working at the infrared wavelength of 1.15 micron was reported. That's a high gain line, but then people were more interested. By the way, Ali Chavain then went to MIT. <coughs> uh, then Helen White worked on that, and two years later, I mean, one year later, he got the first continuous wave visible laser, helium neon laser wave. And that became the most useful laser for a long time. Now today, you can get the helium neon laser work in the red, the green, and the orange, and your high power lasers, for example, from Siemens, and you can have different colors from helium neon. Now, CO2 laser was invented in 1964 by uh, Kumar Patel. He's an Indian guy, very aggressive there. He was my director when he first joined. And then he moved from Homedale to Murray Hill. And later on, I guess he got a lot of publicity because that's the first really high power laser, which can cut the steel plate and things of that nature. And then you have the Bill Silvers, who uh, developed the helium cadmium laser in 1969. And in Scientific American 1973, he wrote a review article about how he developed all this laser, not only helium cadmium, but helium selenium metal vapor laser with multiple color. And then he retired and went to Florida. Now, every retiree goes to Florida nowadays. And he, uh, he was a professor in the uh, University of Central Florida uh, in Orlando. <coughs> the helium cadmium laser became a very useful laser because that's the, one of the first few continuous wave a laser in the blue in, in the UV can be, uh, right now you can buy such a laser and used in uh, making DVD and CDs and laser printing, uh, even can microscopy, cancer detection, fluorescence uh, spectroscopy. 
Okay, and for resin, M star substitute. So helium cadmium laser become very, very useful. Then you have the neodymium yak laser. Now, most of you work with the neodymium yak laser, probably. Joe Goosen invented in 1964 <coughs> with a material scientist called the Muter. You can see that they published in the dry physics letter. And the yak laser is a solid state laser. It's not like a CO2 laser, which is a gas laser, very difficult to handle. The yak laser is much easier to handle, and so many people want it. So Bella cannot handle the request. So they encouraged uh, Marty Cohen, Dr. Marty Cohen, to start a company called Quantronics to become a, a company to produce yak laser for all the demand. I know Marty Cohen well because I worked with him later on. The company still exists in Long Island, and there is a, such a unit in Acrea, in the Professor Walter Montrose's lab. Okay, but what's interesting is they actually are very useful <coughs> for industrial uh, material processing and for marking system, and even for automobile manufacturing. So without such a laser, I think today's uh, Toyota or Nissan cars and or Mercedes-Benz, all that probably would be much, much more expensive. And now people are moving to dial laser power laser. This is a high power semiconductor dial laser. Yeah, you can uh, use that. Uh, by the way, it's not just a dial laser, it's a dial laser from fiber laser. So this is a very interesting direction in terms of practical uh, application. Now if you look at the belt invention of the belt invention of the telephone, it actually is uh, the setting of the belt is the most important accomplishment besides this invention of the, of the Bell Lab, of the telephone. I joined Bell Lab in Homedale, New Jersey. Okay? Uh, and let me mention that the, Thomas Edison actually invented the light bulb, and he was uh, considered a genius, and he actually uh, was called a wizard of Menlo Park in New Jersey. Now remember, he was the first one to set up a research lab, thinking that by himself alone is not enough. He needed to set up a team, set up a research lab, for a company, not for university. So this industrial research lab, he was the pioneer. He set up the first one, and um, it looks like this. If you go to New Jersey, you can visit Thomas Edison Museum. You still see the old research lab which he set it up. So Bell actually was a model after him. It's in New Jersey, and Menlo Park, and Murray Hill. It's not even one hour spot. So this is Murray Hill. And then after the invention of the transistor, they built a Bell Lab in Homedale, and that's when I joined Bell Lab. I'm sorry, after that I joined Bell Lab. But when they built Homedale, they decided to build a water tower in the shape of the transistor, the discrete transistor, where you have emitter, collector, and base, three legs. So very rarely you see the three leg water tower, but this is called a transistor water tower. And it still exists today. If you go there, Homedale is no longer functioning as a Bell Lab, but this transistor tower is still there. And I joined this lab because I like the green pasture. I like the big eye, you know, big piece of long and eye, uh, uh, and, and, and the trees. I don't like the Murray Hill, just the building and the lab. I like this wide open space. So sometimes your career somehow is dictated by what you like to see every day. Okay, this is the Bell Lab. It can house uh, about 6,000 people. And I actually got my PhD from UC Berkeley, and um, I joined this lab. He stayed there for a long time. And this lab now become Lucent, and later on become Akatel Lucent, and now it's no longer functioning as well lab because they could not maintain it. Okay, now let's look at the communication. The communication aspect means you communicate uh, using laser light. Then Corning developed the Lolo's fiber following Charles Carl's suggestion in the, uh, in the paper. And so you have Bell Labs and Corning. Co-developed a very, very, not co-developed, but almost independently developed a very low loss fiber. And then NDT uh, did a very good job uh, doing achieving the ultra low loss fiber and pointing out that the minimum loss is actually in the 1.55 micron region and not 1.3 micron. And so I was working about that. And my interest in is not just the fiber loss, because fiber loss means you can send very long distance, but if the capacity is very small. It's not interesting. So I was interested in what are the parameters which determine the ultimate capacity. Right? So it's a dispersion of the fiber and nonlinear effect of the fiber. So I focused my early career 
focus on these two aspects. But later on, I moved to Balfour much more into system. So this is my early paper. So I uh, actually was responsible for the dispersion shift to fiber and dispersion compensating fiber earlier on. And now you can shift the dispersion of the fiber so that the minimum dispersion line up with the minimum loss. And that is extremely important in the uh, long distance energy fiber optic network. And this is an early uh, paper in optics layer. It's an optical equalization which then turned into uh, dispersion compensation. And this same idea is used for uh, pulse compression of the picosecond and femtosecond uh, laser pulses. And you design an energy system, let's say 10,000 kilometers. You have to design not only consider the dispersion, but nonlinear effect and the noise accumulation. Without dispersion compensation, you know, they actually cannot send very far. And this is the fiber optic laboratory as compared with uh, the regular bulk optics laser lab. And I also worked on the uh, nonlinear optical uh, conversion. And I think that I was credited to be one of the first to develop the supercomputing. Not with the picosecond pulses, but with the nanosecond pulses. But the basic mechanisms are the same. And we were a feature in a biological advertisement in science, physics today, and all that in, in the early 80s. OK, that was me then, that was me now. So I learned that everybody is young only once. OK, and then our work was uh, included in this book, Nonlinear Microoptics. Now, I must say that in IBM and other places, they also developed uh, very good laser. This is, uh, the dye laser developed by IBM and Eastman Kodak helped to improve a great deal because the chemistry doesn't know how to handle dyes. Uh, so this is a dye laser lab which looks very messy, eventually, because the bandwidth of the dye is very, very large. So you actually can uh, use the full bandwidth for more locking and get a very, very short pulses. Because the ability to generate very short pulses you start the ultra fast photonic technology direction. Not only that, because you can squeeze in 10 to the 12 pulses within one second. And people begin to talk about terabit per second optical communication. So it's all related. So I would say from 1960 to 1980, that's the golden age of Bell Labs. Now, uh, Argon Ion Laser was the, uh, invented by Bill Bridge in Hughes Research Lab. And then high sapphire laser by Peter Morton in the MIT Lincoln Lab, which become very useful laser today. Now, Basel, one of the Nobel recipients from Russia, developed the Exomo laser, which is much shorter in wavelength into the UV. And uh, uh, Blumbergen is the pioneer in nonlinear optical effect. Because when the laser intensity is very strong, then you can have a various nonlinear response from the materials the laser interact with. And, uh, this is a very, very interesting field. Even as of today, so many of you are still working uh, using this uh, technology, whether it's the frequency generation, frequency conversion, or optical parametric uh, amplification or oscillation. Now, supercontinuum uh, sources become a commercial source, which you can use for all kinds of spectroscopy. Now, Professor Ron Shen of UC Berkeley Physics Department was a top student of Lumberg and of Harvard, and he went to UC Berkeley <coughs> I became a professor there, and I was lucky to take a course from him when I was at UC Berkeley. I was in double E department, I was in physics, but many of us in the double E department in the laser area, they took the course from, from him. And he has published a book later on in this. Uh, and in fiber, of course, he also had a special textbook. Now, these three gentlemen invented transistor, and that started the whole microelectronics industry in Silicon, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley, because it, Shockley started a company called the Shockley Semiconductor. Many people want to join him. And, but in his company, Shockley is a poor manager, and he doesn't treat people very well. So the student or the people who joined him then left him and started a company called Fairchild. And some of the people who left Fairchild and started a company called Intel. And Intel <laughs> is now, of course, the biggest player. And Shockley called his people traitors, OK, they, because they left him. But, uh, what can you say? OK. And then, because the semiconductor material become important, the people try to make the laser in semiconductor. Uh, and the first semiconductor laser was reported in 1962, but it's a pulse laser. And one of them is by uh, Professor Nick Holonia, who is a John Padin professor at the University of Illinois, because he was the first student of John Padin at the University of Illinois. 
And first, the CW uh, semiconductor laser in room temperature developed at Bell Lab, but simultaneously also by Russian. So after we received the Nobel Prize, but the, the two guys on the right uh, they didn't get the similar recognition. Okay, now today we have dial laser used in laser printer, which actually changed the fate of Euro packet. So if you know HP the history, today HP is just struggling because of the decision of switching over to making printer and PC instead of high end instrumentation, which is left to company now called Edgerton. So even as of today, the HP's decision, because the laser printer success, because sometimes you're successful in one product and then you are misguided and you go into that direction, 10 years later you may regret it's too late. Okay, CD and DVD uh, player with the red dial laser, the pickup head, and that actually required very inexpensive red laser. First, developed by Sharp and Sony. So we have to thank Sharp and Sony for ability to buy you know, CD and DVD player today. But this use of technology called MBE, molecular beam detection, developed by Dr. Alfred Schultz at Bell Lab a long time ago. He received all kinds of awards, very important awards, except for the price. And, and then, uh, knowing that you can, you can move to carbon nitride to get the blue wavelength, so you can increase the information storage capacity, uh, Dr. Uh, Suchi Nakamura of Michia worked on this for years, and he reported success in, um, I think it's in 1996 or 1995, and he actually astonished the field. Because it's somebody who nobody knows him, all of a sudden he is a whole worldwide success story. So he was recruited to go to UC Santa Barbara, become a chair professor there. And he didn't even speak very good English, but he did very good research. And in 2006, he received the Millennium Technology Prize, which is 1 million euros. Not only that, American lawyers taught him how to sue Michia. Michia made a lot of money. And Dr. Suji Nakamura didn't receive any benefit from the money, the profit which Michia made. So they sued Michia in the US, of course, they succeeded. There's an American lawyer behind it, right? So he became the richest performance professor ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, the red laser and blue laser, you know, because the wavelength and the spot size is smaller, the information density is much higher. So now you have Blu ray DVD today, you can watch high definition movies. And you can even watch Star Wars, right? If you look at Star Wars, it's, a, it's very interesting. The key element in the Star Wars is what? Lightsaber, right? Wonders of the light. <laughs> <laughs> and also Yoda, the Jedi Master. You have to learn from him. And the way he speaks is very interesting. Much to learn, you still have. So I actually like Star Wars. If you have never watched the Star Wars, this is the time to buy this complete set. Okay. Now, you don't need to just to use a Blu-ray Blu -ray to get the storage intensity, I mean, density high. You can go to the near field, super resolution. So below the diffraction limit, even better. And you can use, use holograph, holographic storage. Right? Let's talk about hol holography and holography. Right? In General Electric, uh, I think a couple of years ago, beginning to look at the 500 gigabyte and terabyte uh, uh, optical storage with a multivariate structure. And uh, the most important application, actually, is credit card. <coughs> okay. MIT uh, Media Lab and also W Professor Stephen Benton has been working on holography for many years. He was the first one to propose using uh, hologram in credit card. And now hologram is not only using credit card, it's using money. When you use a euro or your Swedish corner, take it out, look at the back. There is a hologram there. So every day we use money we we'll use credit card, we have to thank who? Dennis Gable and Steve Benton. Okay, how about this? Right? In Hong Kong, every evening at 8 p.m., you go to Hong Kong, go to Victoria Harbor, there's a light show, specifically for attracting tourists. Okay? So now, laser, laser everywhere. In fact, I have a laser pointer. Right? This green laser pointer is not the same as the red laser pointer. The red laser pointer is a dial laser only. The green laser pointer is a dial pump solid state laser. 
if a high power diode laser is pumping in the crystal, then it's converted to second harmonic frequency in the green. So this is simple laser pointer of green. Actually, embody the diode laser pump solid state laser. <coughs> and the idea to make this into product actually was started with one of the PhD students, PhD students in National Geology University, or I'm still a guest chair professor. One of the professors in photonics, his PhD student decided to start a company making this. So don't, don't think that uh, you study fundamental uh, aspect of photonics uh, and you keep doing that, because maybe some of your students want to start a company and, and, and become an entrepreneur. Now, if you look at Coco, this is a spin off from this group. Okay? This is a dial pump solid state laser in different wavelengths <coughs> and using nonlinear crystal. You can use it for biophotonics, for many applications. Now, the Exxon laser is, and some UV lasers are very useful for biomedical applications, but in addition, early days they were used to make a fiber brack rating. Now remember, the brack and brack, Nobel Prize, father and son team. So this the brack rating are very useful in DWDM as an optical filter, optical channel drop, and optical multiplexer. But in addition, the brack rating uh, allows the fiber uh, bright grating to be used as a fiber sensor. So, if you look at the Department of Homeland Security website, most of you probably don't know what is Department of Homeland Security. It was a set up after 911. Okay? After the disaster of 911, they set up the Homeland Security, and one of the sections involved technology of telecom, fiber optics, and information technology. And you notice here, in addition to broadband physical security, there's a sensor network. Sensor network means fiber and some other sensor everywhere. This is a slide from University of Tokyo professor showing that you can put sensor everywhere to detect and probably help the security. So this is called a fiber optic neural system. It's the sensor and the communication network together. Okay, so we have to thank Brack for this, right? He probably didn't know that we mention his name every day, you know, FBG, fibrograph laser. Now, the medical application of a laser uh, is a widespread uh, significance, and I don't have time to go into that, but I want to mention uh, you can use it for eye surgery and, and you can use it to do LASIK. But I want to give you a word of caution, because LASIK is not 100% successful. Some people try to sue them, uh, the, 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 the medical doctors, or even the operation. Because if you go look at the Wikipedia, Andrew LASIK, they'll tell you that the American Food and Drug Administration expert has shown that the risk of LASIK outbreak the benefit. Because there's over 150 negative reports over the last uh, eight or nine years that uh, they have bad consequences. And the reason is that LASIK removes the short-sightedness. We move some of the high order effect, but make some of the higher order optical effect much worse. So if you happen to be one of these 140 people, it's an irreversible process for life. So better watch out. So one of the professors advised that we should study more about a higher order correction before everybody uses the LASIK. But most of the medical doctor, eye doctor, they want to make quick money because you buy a laser machine. Set, you know, in five minutes you make a two thousand dollars. Why not? Right? You know, be careful. Okay. Now let me go on to the next uh, topic, and then I'll stop right here. This is called smart photonics. You know, Barco. It's a laser scanner. I use it in, in supermarket cell checkout. So I, I I do that in the U.S. But I went to ICA. I couldn't read the Swedish. Science, so I, I don't know how to do that. But this is very useful. And now you have 2D barcode. You don't need a laser scanner anymore. You use CCD, which is, of course, invented by uh, Bill Boyer and George Smith. And now the barcodes are used in a hospital, medical testing, and the 2D barcode contain more information. So it's beginning to be used everywhere, including Norwegian Air, <laughs> including United Air, including TCP and including what? UPS, Flavor Express. Look, I ordered something from Amazon.com. In, instead of reading this, the machine doesn't recognize my address. The 
all the machine know is buckle, buckle, buckle. Same thing with the right? There's a one debug code here. There's a two debug code here. So the point here is the whole world cannot move without airplane, but also cannot move without smartphone. Smartphone only pick up information, know where you want to go, know where you need to deliver. But then, underlying this, you need a ubiquitous high-speed fiber and wireless system, because otherwise this information cannot be sent back and forth across the continent. Okay, let me finish here. Uh, 2D barcode can also be used to connect to the internet web page if you're a smartphone. For example, you go to Denmark, Copenhagen, Rosenborg Castle, they didn't tell you anything just a 2D marker link to that web page. Same thing here, you go to Nordic Museum, right here. How many of you have been there? Nordic Museum recognized that this is the brochure. The barcode is very large here, as large as Vasa. <laughs> if you go inside, you see how big the Vasa statue is, right? <laughs> this is interesting. So, ancient culture, ancient museum are now beginning to use modern smartphones. I'm just telling you this as an example. And this is all because of laser light. Okay, I don't have time to go to the, 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 the fiber stuff, but I want to jump to the point where I can tell you that the, <coughs> the whole world now is connected. Here. Let me go through this. Here. The whole world is now connected with fiber. 1988, there's only one fiber in the ocean, or long no haul in the but now there's hundreds of them. In fact, there are so many of them. Here, let me show you. By AT&T, by Japanese company KDD, by French company Akata. And for quite a few years, we call this uh, the three kingdoms because they collaborate with each other and they also compete against each other. They actually build the entire global fiber optic network. And without this global fiber optic network, the internet doesn't work. Hmm. And you can see the way they build it, because it's too much competition. So Atlantic, there's too many fibers. <laughs> Some other area, not enough fiber. No. For example, in Africa, not enough fiber. <coughs> but if you look at here, even Africa is experiencing broadband explosion. <coughs> they are going to deploy a lot of fiber. If they want to deploy terabit per second. It's not imaginable 10 years ago that Africa needed terabit per second fiber optic network, but it's happening because their internet use rate is growing like a crazy because they start with very low pace. Same thing in the Middle East, but this is where the growth uh, are coming from. Right? So in Africa, <laughs> it's a top line, we still need the wireless. Same thing here. So, when we look at the Nobel Prize award to Charles Cow and uh, Bill Boyle and George Smith, they indeed are the master of light uh, in this particular setting. So there's the internet, and the internet really travel in the ocean. Remember, under the ocean, all your email, all your Google search, all your Facebook, all the signals goes out as a form of laser light. Maybe 100 gigabit, even if you have a gigabit per second in the channel, your traffic is merged with many other people's traffic. But without a speed of light, every Google page you turn to, you have to wait for 10 seconds or one minute. Would you use it? You would not. Okay? So it looks like you can just connect wirelessly or wireline, connect to the globe, and you get the information. You have Yahoo and Google, you can go to Facebook, and you can search all the information. For example, I, I, know I searched the beautiful Stockholm Particular, and it gave me all the information in how many seconds, not even one second. Of course, their server is very powerful, but to send this information to you uh, requires this global fiber optic network. Right? Beautiful picture. Not just Google, I remember there's a Another company called Bin.com, the same thing. Okay, now, many people wanted to buy Encyclopedia Britannica, 
Long time ago, I wanted to own a set. I couldn't afford it, so I bought the Bulletproof, which is, I think, much better and less expensive. But look at here, it costs $1,500, and in English only. You go to Wikipedia, it's in multiple languages, and it's free, and it's updated. If you have a Kindle ebook, you can read a complete encyclopedia, a complete Shakespeare for less than one dollar. It's not possible to print. And you can read color book. It's in milk. And recently, just yesterday, Amazon and where else the Kindle file. That's a tablet PC. So in the future, nobody wants my PC. Nobody wants your PC. They want a tablet PC, which looks like iPad and it's more powerful. Okay, this is iPad and this is the high definition, high demand movie services where you can watch types of movie. And that's the problem because you can, you, know, you can watch too many movies. And it's 3D. It's a 3D movies coming up. So even at and need to provide services for a 3D football game. Okay. I mean soccer football game. By the way, at and used to be called American Telephone and Telegraph. You cannot get a telegraph service anymore. So at and now, official name is at and it's, it's not spelled out. But you can interpret it as American Telephone and Television. <laughs> and look at the optical societies of America. Monthly magazine. In February, they talk about 3D TV and movies. Now, this is the optical society. We used to design lenses, telescope, images, and now we're talking about 3D movies. So you can see the impact of this growing global internet. And there is a slide which shows the future of TV is the future of Intel. Intel must deal with video because by year 2013, 90% of the web traffic will be video based. Right? And all this travel below the ocean. So whenever there's an earthquake, there might be a problem. When there's a tsunami, there might be a problem. It happened in Taiwan. I don't have time to talk about it. So let me conclude by saying that from the days of ancient Egypt, where pigeons is the telecommunication means, to the telegraph, to the telephone, to the television, this is a long story. And it only happened really over the last 50 some years. And you have fiber around the globe and allow you to do all this, including real time video presence type conference to your living room. So everybody tried to build up the network to 100 gigabit. But I must conclude by saying the most important physical constant that we know is really the speed of light. If God designed the speed of light 100 times slower, we wouldn't have Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I have many more slides, but it's only for the people who might be interested. <laughs> Thank you very nice presentation. So we can take uh, one or two questions. Okay, in this case, uh, let's thank our speaker once again.